clear to me that since we opened and back in 2004 that a lot of things have changed. That there are a lot of other museums that are kind of in, in a similar space uh, as we are in uh, that have emerged over that time frame and that what I knew we had to do was we had to find uh, and maintain the place that we felt we were different and offering something significant. On this edition of Let's Talk Cincy, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. It has a new president and a new strategy. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is billed as a beacon of light for inclusive freedom and justice around the globe, a museum of conscience. Hello, everyone. I'm Curtis Fuller. The organization's mission is to reveal stories of freedom's heroes, from slavery to the social challenges of today. The concept of the Freedom Center was proposed more than 25 years ago. Then in the summer of 2002, a groundbreaking took place. Thousands of people attended, including then First Lady Laura Bush, Oprah Winfrey, and Muhammad Ali. The grand opening finally happened in August 2004. Now a new chapter in the Freedom Center journey. Here's WLWT News 5's Ashley Kirkland. We are sitting here on the backs of those who have contributed so much. Without their vision, uh, without their contributions, the Freedom Center would not be here today, uh, particularly for our region. The museum itself depicts the stories of those American heroes who carried our country from the dark days of the transatlantic slave trade to the freedoms we enjoy today. A history museum goer Liz Galvin from Chicago says she hadn't thought much about since high school. I think now as an adult, like going back and relearning a lot of things, you're like, wow, um, like going through my own life, I've, I've forgotten like what our history was. After 15 years, the Freedom Center is one of the most recognized institutions in the nation when it comes to African American history. Outside of uh, Cincinnati, outside of Ohio. Um, we are a destination and part of the conversation around racial equity uh, as well as uh, implicit bias. I've gone to the Museum of, of African American History and Culture in D.C. Uh, I wasn't in this capacity at the time, but I was looking at it and looking at the things and admiring a lot of things. So I am planning another visit there to do some what I call benchmarking to see what they're doing well and how we might be able to reapply some of the things that they're doing. I have gone to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis and I plan to go there again because they're opening an exhibit that will be coming to Cincinnati in the, in the, in the very near future. Uh, and uh, there are other uh, museums uh, in the area that I am looking to uh, not only go and visit and reapply learnings, but I'm trying to put together a network of, of more cross promotions so that uh, we are generating business for all of us through a network in terms of, you know, if you come to visit the Freedom Center, maybe we can offer you some sort of uh, uh, discount or a benefit for going on down to Louisville or up to the museum up in, uh, in, uh, in Ohio here at Wilberforce and places like that. Moving forward, board members hope to engage the local community more to get Cincinnatians to experience this gym that's in their own backyard. Building a lasting legacy to keep the flame burning for the next generation. Now, as the Freedom Center celebrates its 16th anniversary, there have been many ups and downs over the years. In the center's first year, more than a quarter million people visited from all 50 states and 35 countries. But there were some difficult days as well. About nine years ago, the Freedom Center survived tough financial times. There was even talk that the National Underground Railroad might have to close. But the key word is survive. The Freedom Center merged with the Cincinnati Museum Center. Funding, membership and attendance improved. Now it has a new leader. His name is Woody Keown, a former executive with Procter & Gamble and a respected community and business leader. He says he brings a new vision and a new plan for the center to not only survive, but to thrive. Well, the, the thing that uh, went into my mind was, first, first thought was that I don't know museum. I have not been in the museum business. So I was uh, struggling with how I could add value because I didn't have that museum experience. But as I talked to people, what I found out was that uh, uh, we've got some experts here, some people who've been around a long time. I know that, that part of the business pretty well. But uh, what, what 
came to my mind after talking with people was the value that I could add was bringing a business perspective to the, uh, to the Freedom Center. And once I saw that uh, I could apply my business background, my business experience and skills, uh, skill sets that I've developed over the years, I said that I, I, I think I need to do this. And uh, the passion that I've always had for the Freedom Center was also a significant factor in my decision to, uh, to take this on. Well, going into the 16th year, I think when you look back, what, what uh, as I came in and looked at the organization, and uh, one of the first places I started was looking at the financial situation. Uh, I think my first day on the job, I spent probably half day with the uh, finance uh, committee uh, looking at the numbers. I majored in accounting in school, and so I'm a numbers guy. And working for P&G as long as I did, you have to be a numbers person to, to make it work. But when I came in, uh, I, I looked at the, uh, the, the, the financial situation, and uh, basically uh, I, I, I tried to dig in to find out what was going on. And um, I uh, used my business background and did a competitive analysis. And it was clear to me that since we opened and back in 2004, that a lot of things had changed. That there are a lot of other museums that are kind of in, in a similar space uh, as we are in uh, that have emerged over that time frame. And that what I knew we had to do was we had to find uh, and maintain the place that we felt we were different and offering something significant. Which basically leads to the fact that we are here at, at this particular location that Mr. Westmoreland and others tell me about all the time. But this particular location, Ohio's significance in, this, in the Underground Railroad Freedom Center and things like that are the things that I felt were our points of differentiation. And so I basically uh, put together a strategic plan that was focused on, number one, refreshing our whole museum, uh, bringing it up to date with new technology, uh, making, offering more immersive uh, experiences for our visitors. And the other thing I looked at was basically what we needed to do is to change our business model. We needed to uh, develop some business models and strategies that were going to be more uh, open to uh, new ideas and new ways of generating sustainable revenue for the for the Freedom Center. One of the things that is part of the strategic plan is I had a plank in there dealing with organization capability. And as part of that, it was uh, we have to change the culture. We wanted to do some change, make some changes to the culture, and we wanted to, my strategy was basically to provide a more customer-friendly, customer-oriented kind of culture so that when people first interact and come in contact with the Freedom Center, they had that same positive experience throughout the, the entire, from the time they get on our website to the time they walk into the door, anybody they come in contact. Now, we still have work to do. I'm not trying to say we're finished, but I'm trying to uh, instill that sense of customer-friendly, customer service to, to, to throughout the organization with everybody, and we're going to be doing some training. I, I spent a lot of time working on that. I spent a lot of time working and walking through the museum and, and different departments so that I can learn what's going on and find out what the challenges are for the staff and so forth. But that's been part of the part of the journey to, to change the culture and change the change the the the, uh, the experience that people have when they come in contact with us. I'm confident that we're going to be here, and uh, I'm confident that we're going to get beyond survival to thriving. Uh, I, I feel really confident with the strategic plan that we put in place. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, the response I've gotten from significant donors that I've spoken with, people in the community, the staff is, is, is responding very positive to it. I am confident that there's a lot of support out there and uh, what we need to do is tap into it. And uh, that means hard work in terms of going out and building relationships with some people that we've lost connections with. Uh, and I, I think that uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, in fact, I'm, I would say I'm excited about the future of the Freedom Center based on the response that I've received from people in the community. We've uh, restructured the organization as part of our strategic planning process, and uh, we have we had the um, when I came in the um, the membership uh, responsibilities were split across a couple of different departments, and there was a middle section that I felt was missing as I an analyzed the situation, and that uh, our members that are in existence on the roles today we were not doing enough to basically show them the value of membership. We we're not engaging them enough in terms of communicating, bringing them down and showing them the value of being here and engaging them in terms of our community engagement work. So uh, membership is a key focus area for us. We've got a, a new structure in place that's going to bring that together for us and hopefully make a big difference for us. The importance of this institution to the community, I would say to the nation, is, is just an awesome responsibility that I didn't 
fully appreciate until I got in the chair and started going out and inter inter interfacing with people. But when I look at uh, the Freedom Center and the faces that come in my mind, you're talking about people like uh, Pastor Lynch. You're, you're talking about people like Edward Go. You're talking about people like uh, Marion Spencer. You're talking about people at John Pepper. Uh, you're talking about people like like Dr. Westmoreland here. I mean, there are so many people. There are a lot of names that I, I could go on and on and on in terms of naming folks. But from what I remember when I was sitting down on, a, on Marin Way, the night that people marched across that bridge and saw the candles and so forth, it was a very inspirational moment. And uh, there are just so many people that, that, that put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to, to bring this institution here uh, and to make it what it's become today. Uh, so they are, they're great, and uh, I just feel the awesome responsibility of carrying it forward and, and achieving the vision that they laid out for the Freedom Center. And up next, the Underground Railroad Freedom Center and a conversation about historical truth with historian Carl B. Westmoreland when Let's Talk Cincy continues. You might describe Carl B. Westmoreland as the keeper of the flame. He is the senior historian at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. He has a passion for historic preservation, and his community activism is well documented over the past 50 years. The vision that we started with um, is in the process of being renewed. And it's being renewed because there have been enough of us who remain behind through changes uh, to make sure that we refocused on why we exist and hopefully they'll pass on to our great grandchildren, not our sons and daughters, but to our great grandchildren. It's not only to uh, benefit people of color, black people, brown people, but to benefit America. For people to not understand that one of the greatest historic events happened right on this spot when Margaret and Robert Garner crossed the Ohio River with their parents and their four children and the fifth on the way, and that that stopped uh, America in the 1850s to say they're human, they matter, that's a family where the woman was being raped. And this place and Music Hall gave us a forum to remember. So the changes that have occurred hopefully will allow us to not only continue to remember, but then talk about potential solutions so that America moves closer to why it was founded originally so that all of us could celebrate freedom. There's an effort, uh, it's in incubation at this point, uh, to build a memorial uh, to Margaret Garner and her family. And it's really a mo memorial that would celebrate something that most people think does, does not exist, the black family. And, and it's important, uh, whether it exists in your house or not, uh, that we go back to that. Uh, the family, the church, uh, the moral focus of our presence here. This is the first building in this city ever of any stature where black and white men and women worked on it together. The stonework was done by the Hodge family from Lincoln Heights, Morris Hodge and his five sons and some of the neighbors in Lincoln Heights. And they did the stonework that had been done uh, and passed down through the ages from Egypt to Alabama to here. And uh, so the, the building celebrates uh, the architectural uh, genius of a black architect and his black interior designer wife who were educated at Howard University. And we put it at the front door of this city. And hopefully it'll be here at least another 500 years. 
will thrive if we tell our sons and our daughters and our granddaughters and our great granddaughters so that they understand that this comes with uh, life itself. And it's an opportunity to celebrate uh, the least of us in a way so that we understand that each element, each ethnic group in this community has value and we celebrate it here. It says that each of our individual bodies matter. It's a place where everyone has value. And I think we failed when we began uh, to forget. We took it for granted. Uh, marriages, everything else dissolve. If you don't kiss somebody and say, you know, you're special just because you exist. Like Fountain Square, like the rotunda of the, uh, of what uh, my late wife used to call uh, her welcoming uh, when she came out of the mountains in the cold fields of West Virginia. It's a place uh, that we need to honor and make some small sacrifice of $65 to maintain. Up next, more than a museum, the Freedom Center's goal to remain a convener of dialogue and the push for social justice. Back in a moment. The past few years, I've read several articles that point to an increased interest in black history. Good news for museums across the country, like the King Center down in Atlanta, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, the African American History and Culture Museum in Washington, D.C., and of course, the Freedom Center right here in Cincinnati. The Freedom Center was built for such a time as this. Um, if you think about the mission as it relates to encouraging and creating freedom's heroes, I think our nation finds itself where it needs more heroes than ever before. And so um, when we start to look at what has happened in the last, uh, you know, since June 2020, uh, where we started seeing voices of those who have been marginalized amplified. Um, I think it was time uh, for a lot of organizations to give those voices a platform uh, and then take an active role in informing our community about the struggle. Our community finds itself at the intersection of several pandemics happening at the same time. Right? You've got the health disparities, you've got the economic disparities, and then you also <clears throat> have an election that's coming up in, in less than uh, three months. And so. Um, what we have to do is recognize that all that we've dealt with um, as it relates to those three, I call it pandemics, um, have been around for decades. And so our, or, our organization has to have been nimble enough to be able to then uh, make a pivot to be able to serve the community that we represent, uh, even in this new date and time. And so um, our leader, uh, uh, Woody, has done a fantastic job as it relates to embracing the challenges that uh, COVID and shutting down has caused us, but he didn't sit still and not do anything. What he did was uh, put a vision together for the Freedom Center, re retool ourselves so that we can introduce ourselves back to the world in a stronger position. And so um, in partnership with uh, the program uh, director, Chris Miller, um, they now have both um, uh, on-site programming as well as virtual programming. Um, they have a wonderful series uh, that has been created around having these conversations that we're all having at the dinner table um, among our friends uh, but sharing it broadly and trying to get the information out so that we can influence change. And so um, I would probably say, you know, the, 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 the bottom line of this thing is, is that um, every business has had to uh, shift its model. Uh, the Freedom Center continues to, to shift its model. It's not 100% there yet, um, but I would probably say that, um, you know, our leadership has been very proactive as it relates to how, it, how it's using this time. Uh, we want to create a safe environment uh, for people to learn. And so while we have opened our doors again, uh, it is with the caution of keeping everybody safe. Uh, and then the other part is, is that we've had to extend our platform to some very vibrant um, online and digital ways that we can uh, keep people engaged and, and share the information. Um, none of this would be possible without the continuous support of the Freedom Center. So our members, uh, our corporate sponsors, um, our Philanthropists, uh, they're all the reason why we're able to continue to, uh, to move this mission forward.
we're proud, and I think what's different about us relative to everyone else's contribution is the fact that our location has us right in the heart of what is called the National Underground Railroad, the pathway to freedom. Um, our conversations have centered around this idea of um, looking at what the African American experience has been. Um, and so we join those institutions in telling our part of the story. I, I also think our mission, uh, we've always uh, prided ourselves of being a convener of these conversations, a national discussion uh, that needs to happen, should happen right in the middle where, right on the, on the line where you will, on one side of the river you were free and the other side you weren't. Um, and so I think we're perfectly positioned uh, to be able to make a, a contribution. So uh, as early as I think maybe about a month or two ago, um, uh, a lot of African American museums uh, got together and created a network uh, in which it had a, uh, a, a virtual event uh, which invited people inside their walls. So the great part about that was, was that we were able to participate in the national dialogue on, along with other institutions. Um, maybe even had uh, some impressions uh, and had some dialogues and engagement with people who had never been to Cincinnati or never been into our walls. But we found a way to uh, to, to make our contribution. So I, I would say that we're going to continue to do those type of things. Um, but I do think we we're every every African American museum is built a little differently. Each institution uh, is built for its purpose, and ours was um, you know this idea of perseverance and courage. And so. Um, you know, we are proud to be in a federation of those uh, great institutions that you name. Uh, we're proud to represent Cincinnati in that way. Um, but I think we're uniquely positioned to, 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 to amplify, uh, convene these voices, and inspire people to, uh, to bring these freedoms forth. Um, our ability to be able to make this pivot and tell these national stories with regard to what is happening in today's social context, um, you know, the injustices that are there and calling for action for those who can, who can fix it. Um, and then I think even when we start to think about um, this upcoming election, you know, we, we have this opportunity to get as many uh, people participating in the process, but they have to be, they have to know their rights. And Woody says that it's thriving is not just a financial piece. Uh, it is the, uh, the ripple effect that comes from, um, you know, being consistent on social change and, and, and being change agents. As we talk about the Freedom Center, it's fitting I leave you with a quote from the late judge Nathaniel R. Jones. He said, a person must be a beacon of light that will illuminate dark places. Judge Jones was one of the Freedom Center's biggest supporters. He passed away earlier this year. Judge Jones was a recipient of the center's highest honor, the International Freedom Conductors Award. Other recipients have included Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Dr. Dorothy I. Height, President Bill Clinton, President George H.W. Bush, and Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Well, that does it for the program today. I'm Curtis Fuller. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Let's Talk Sensei.